back to the Unseen series. So we started the Unseen series in March, and this week is the final week of the series. The series, why it is titled Unseen, is for us to really and truly get more knowledge. You know what I mean? Get better understanding of some spiritual aspects that exist that we may not see with our natural eyes, but they do exist and they do affect our lives. Yeah? And one of the, one of the goals of this series is that we want to educate persons. We want to make you knowledgeable so that the end result is that you guys, or we guys, all of us, will be able to be victorious like what we were talking about, yeah? So this morning, we are at the 11th week. And when I was given this topic and I thought about it, I said to myself, wow, but this is the deciding factor. I said, this one is the game changer. And not to say that the game wasn't good before in the other matches. It was excellent. Prophet and the minister did an excellent job. Please put your hands together for them. Yeah, man, excellent. But this week, the topic or the word that I was given, I believe that it is the epicenter of our faith and our belief system. It rides on it. Yeah? Um, I'm going to tell you the word in just a minute. Let us go to, over to our opening scripture first. The opening scripture for this morning is taken from Acts 16, verses 25 to 34. That is Acts 16, 25 to 34. And it reads, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. Because he's not going to be a witness. But Paul shouted, stop! Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling to Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they and they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. See what I must tell people about salvation? Favor, yes. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in the Lord. Father, this is your word. This is your truth. I pray, mighty God, that you will add your anointing to it. I pray that it will accomplish what it is that you have intended for it to accomplish. And I pray, dear God, that hearing and just even saturating and being in this word today, we will be the better for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we'll be unpacking the topic of salvation, right? Now, as a church, one of our, well, one of our objectives is to spread the gospel, spread the good news to persons, mankind, everybody. And the intent is to point persons in the direction of Jesus. One of the ways that we intend to do that is to preach salvation, to introduce persons to salvation. Not just preaching from here, but the worship team, the pure in heart, us, heart care, all of the teams, everybody from your step, pure in heart, that is a part of the objective. That is a part of why we do what we do, yeah? So what is a formal definition of salvation? And I'm going to ask media to project it. It's a little long, but it's loaded. The, the definition of salvation is 
the work of God offered by grace to transform a soul from sin and its consequences through acceptance of God's conditions of repentance by faith in Jesus Christ. Very long, I know. But there are some, there are some key points in that definition. One, it's the work of God. Two, it offered by grace. And we're going to get down into that a little bit later. Three, it is, it, there's transformation, meaning you're not going to be the same when you experience it, right? There's some sort of change that should happen. And how the change is effected through acceptance of repentance. And then it is done by faith in Jesus. So it's sort of cyclical, you know, everything sort of add up to bring us to that point of salvation. Now, generally, when we think of salvation as, a, as people, generally, whether locally, overseas, anywhere, we tend to think of salvation as that morning when you walk down the aisle right there, so, and you stand up, and you close your eyes, and probably two tears run down your face, and they say, Lord Jesus, what may I do you now? And then you may repeat the repentance prayer. Generally, persons, when you tell persons that, oh, I got saved, and then they say, oh, you turn Christian now? That is what they equate it to. However, in researching this topic a little bit more, I, I, I asked the question, so is salvation an event or is it a process? Because according to the word of God, one, salvation is for everybody, which means it's not just for the saved, but it's also for the unsaved, right? Two, it speaks about us being saved past tense and being saved present and being saved future. So what exactly is it? So I turn to the word of God, right? Now, in looking at the word of God and looking at the definition parallel, I realize there are some words that are associated with the word salvation through scripture, dictionary, everybody. One of those words, deliverance. Another of those words, recovery. Another one, redemption, forgiveness, saving, churchy word, sanctification. What that mean? Don't worry, I'm going to Google it. <laughs> we will talk about it in a little bit. But if you notice those words, it's something that can happen at right now at this point in time. Or it can be something that happens in progress. It's progressive. Yeah? And that would beg to infer that salvation is not just an event, but indeed it is a process. Let us go to the word of God. Ephesians 2, 8 reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. Next scripture. So that one is saying we have been saved. Been past it. Now, next scripture. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So when we look at salvation now, it begs to say, you're looking at the past, you're looking at what is happening now, and you're looking at the future because we are being saved. It is also sort of implying that it's good to look at what are we saved from? Like what's happening, why we have to be saved? Who are we saved by? And what are we saved to? Easy, quest, easy answers from definition and all of that. Well, easy to us. To so some it may not. So if you're asked, what are you being saved from? Sin and its consequences. What, who are we saved by? We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in nobody else. Not faith in your mother. Not faith in your auntie. Not faith in your boss. But faith in Jesus Christ. And the message of Jesus Christ needs to be clear in that definition. When you're speaking to persons about salvation, you have to or we should mention the name of Jesus Christ. There are many religions out there. And many of them have a form of salvation attached to them. 
But based on what we believe, we believe in Jesus Christ. Right. What are we saved to? We are saved to persevere in faith. We are saved to a call to righteousness. We are saved to a call to holiness. Not popular things nowadays. Most people want to be saved to receive something. Most people want to be saved so that the Lord will answer our prayers and we say, yeah, man, God is good because he answered. But the truth of the matter is that we are saved so that we can be we are called to holiness and righteousness so that we can be transformed and that we can develop into being the people that God has intended us to be. That is why we are saved. Yeah? yeah. So last week, Minji spoke about heaven and she did an excellent job. The week before, Mindij spoke about hell, did an excellent job as well. And something that was resounding in those two messages is that heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. And Minji's had this little brother tweet last week that there's a thin line in between the two. This other line. Salvation is the line in between the two. Salvation is the game changer and what really and truly makes the difference. And as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not salvation with you just coming down the aisle and saying that repentance prayer. It is about you being saved. Yeah? So let us look at some myths that people normally attach to salvation. Just like we just bust one a while ago, you know, where people just walk down and say the prayer. That's not all. So that's myth number one. The next myth, uh, because we're a local church, I'll use a little local vernacular right here. The next myth, I'm going to get into character. You probably will remember one thing, you know. Upon Sundays, the people they must dress up and they must go to church. Girl, me buy her stockings and she wear it with the white socks. You know, remember the white socks with the little flower right there, on the tie? And then she must wear the little frock with the tool. And you know, so she tell me, say, the stockings and the tool are scratcher. But she go. And you see, my son, he get one new shoes. So he have to go to church so people can see the new shoes. Anybody experience that? Is anybody scarred by the tool? The stocking. Come on, I know I have a witness. Yes, man, scarred. I don't know if you can pay me to do that again. <laughs> but the truth of the matter, myth number one is, Coming to church, being a member of a church, doing religious acts does not let us be saved. It doesn't. Putting your name down to be on a team, saying, okay, I came when they had outreach, it doesn't let us be saved. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, not everyone who calls out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Can you imagine I've taken so much time also? Oh my goodness. Right. Then Matthew 15, 8 says, These people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Coming to church, being a part of a team, it's good. It's very good. It's good for your process of salvation, but it is not required for your salvation. Myth number two. Character again. <laughs> Boy. Uh, one thing in a certain nurse, may I tell you, my grandmother and um, prayer saved me, you know, I don't know about you, Barsa. The prayers of your mother, your granny, your father, your friend, your co-worker, they cannot save us. They cannot save us. What those prayers do they encourage us, they spur us on, they inspire us, they plant the seed in our hearts. Some of us, they may scare us, some of us, they may nag us, 
right to salvation. However, it is not what saves us. Salvation really and truly comes down to your personal relationship with God. Myth number three, we can earn our salvation, meaning we can do. I do everything. I serve here so, then I walk outside, I see a little old man, and then I help him out. Then by the time I bust the corner, you know, I see one baby mother, and I just help her because the baby was fussy, and all of that, Lord, I am going to heaven because I did five things good today. I can earn it. And then you, next day, oh my God, I only did two things. Probably I need to top that up tomorrow. So we think that we can earn salvation, right? But the word of God says, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. You see that not by works part? Yes. All right. So... One of the realizations that we should pinpoint is that when we are saved, good works comes out of us. Good works are a result of our salvation. If you were on discipleship last month, you would have heard the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Those things are cultivated. Those are a part of the working of salvation through us. Those are a part of what comes out of us when we are saved and being saved. Myth number four. I'm a good person. Me not kill nobody. Me not steal nothing. Me not talk bad about my neighbor, although she go on in a man. I have not broken into a bank. Me not do nothing like that. Me not trouble people, miss. So... Oh, yes, I remember I drink the coconut water to wash off my heart. <laughs> so I must be saved and go to heaven. We'll just sum it up like this. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and, co and come short of the glory of God. Truth be told is when we put ourselves in a situation when we are determining what is good, what is right, um, what is you must do, what you mustn't do, truly, we have put our place, ourselves, in the place of God. We have now become the judge of righteousness. There are some good things that we can do, but it may not be God. No, we have to know that salvation is not found in legalism. It's not found in a list of to-dos or to-don't. God never lists to say that you must be here by seven or you must always wear a skirt or you must always that. I know different strokes for different folks based on where you are. But when you get to the root of the matter, is your salvation based in that? I don't know if there's a scripture in the Bible, but I didn't see it in my research. But those are some of the myths that we tend to attach to the word salvation while we seek righteousness. As, as, we go th as I was preparing for this word, the Holy Spirit nudged me to say, you can't speak about salvation without speaking about how you are saved. I was like, but Lord, I just want to tell them the message. <laughs> but as I, as I share it, I shared it earlier this morning, and I said, wow, I don't think I've shared it for a while. So anyhow, you know when you're growing up around this time of year, um, for those that are students or children or whatever, if you have children, you know this time of year are exam time. So them do exam, you have class party, and then you have summer. Now, my mother was one that you're going to do your exam and you're going to do good. That's the first thing, because you're not coming here with no failure. That's one. Two, after your exams are finished, you're going to a summer school. You just done school, you know. You have got to one summer school. Because first of all, you're not staying in my yard, running up the JPS bill and eating out all of my food. 
Mm -mm. Two, you're going somewhere because you need to learn something. You're going to camp, you must learn to sew, swim, something. Something. If you do little English and maths, that would be nice too, but something else because you need to be rounded. After you do that for the June now, pack up on the things, on go to your grandmother. <laughs> Out, on going to your grandmother. On a too much town picnic, man, go and go learn life. Right. So my brother and I were shipped off for a month and a half or so every summer. Now, I was shipped off to my grandparents' house. Truth be told, I don't remember them being rich, but I don't remember them being poor, poor. You know what I mean? Like, not poor, poor. And one thing I remember, though, both were saved. Both knew the Lord. Them serve a church, too. So every pan we knock with their church, we go to VBS. They will go to choir rehearsal, even though you know, sing. You go to Bible study. You go to outreach meeting. You go to everything, right? When you reach back now, you go clean up the yard because... On a naga amount to nothing. Right. Clean up the yard and then whatever. But one of the things I can remember distinctively is that my grandmother gave us her most prized possession every son, every summer. And that is every summer she would tell us about Jesus. Every single summer. To all the point where as young as I was and couldn't even spell the name Jesus, she had tell you about Jesus. To the point where when my brother couldn't call the J in the Jesus, she had tell me. And I remember when my brother was eight, I was about six or seven there about. And I remember one night we were going to Becca. Every night, everybody must pray. All if a two sentence, you yeah, pray. One night we were going to bed, and my grandmother, you know, of course, tell us about Jesus and whatever. If you don't behave yourself, Jesus is going to punish you. No, 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 right? But in a love way. It's so weird. They said those things, but I felt so loved. Anyhow, so, <laughs> so I remember one night, we never do nothing bad that day there, I tell you the truth. So we were going to bed, and she said, you want to invite Jesus in your heart? And my brother, yes, 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 yes. And if you know me, I was like, yes, um, uh, I don't know what me a ball for, you know, but me a ball and tell her yes, right? And then my brother, so how we do this now? <laughs> sort of a thing, how? And she said, she, she, she verbalized it in a way that we could understand. And she said, if you say from your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart. If your heart believe what grandma is saying, then you can be saved. You believe? I say yes, grandma. My brother, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and she led us through the sinner's prayer. Now, the rest of that scripture that is taken from, it says that it is with our mouth that we profess and with our heart that we believe and are justified. So remember, we believed before we left Mandeville. So when we came back to Kingston the next, like two weeks after they were about, of course, Grandma tell me already now so she can brace herself to keep us in line. But then we had a helper slash home assistant at the time that used to come. So both of us were running out of the house. Guess what? We are saved. We are Christians. And I remember the distinct look on her face like, Boy, Mrs. K, you sure you didn't want to be to them get saved at that age? Them know what I mean? What I that mean? That mean I believe in Jesus. No, Mrs. K, whatever. Of course, we never see her for a little bit, but she came back eventually. Right? Years later, after that seed was planted in my heart, you know, sort of fall off track. Entertain sin a little bit, you know. A lot bit. <laughs> Entertained in a lot bit. And my brother and I made connection with a young lady. And we used to call her a big sister. She dropped me off, she carried me out, whatever, whatever. Essentially, she used to find alternatives for us not going to parties and not doing things, whatever, and all of those stuff, right? Yeah, man, it's so I did ball too. 
Right. <laughs> so I remember one night she carried us and said, I wanted to meet my bishop. And the bishop comes in and says, oh my God, these kids are such lovely kids. Yeah, 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 whatever, whatever, right? Then she says, I must pray for you before you leave this house. I was like, all right, cool, okay, everybody, yeah. Like one prayer, Jamaica, we take, every, we take every prayer we can get. Yes. And she prayed over my brother and she prophesied over him and whatever. And if you know my brother knows some of those actual things are in fruition. No, you're going to be a mighty man of God. You're going to this, you're going to that. And that he is today. And I remember she stood in front of me. Bishop C, I believe is her name. And she looked at me and she turned her head. And she said, you're so beautiful. But you're so broken and sad. Guys, I don't hear nothing else after that. <laughs> so, so balling. Flat out balling. Flat, like, when we say balling, you, know, you know, like when a mother lose a child weeping and wailing, that was me. I don't know what it is that she said that triggered that, but it triggered. I remember it, it was such a supernatural experience that in in, in the natural, my body felt different. My body literally felt different. I got to my bed a ball, me wake up a ball. Me don't know what me a ball for doing, you know, but I just knew I was crying. But one of the things I remember from that experience is that my life has never been the same. Never been the same. After that, it was, oh, do you come in here? No. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> no, to go through that again, no, you know what I mean? And my interest changed as well. All of a sudden, I was no longer interested in the holy heap parties and the holy heap friends and the holy heap. And it's not that I was a terrible person at parties. It's just that I was in an environment entertaining sin that did not glorify God. And I knew at that point in time that my heart was for the sin and not entertaining God. Yeah? So that is a little of the backstory of what has brought me to this place right now. Let us talk about some truths of salvation. Because these are some of the things that along my journey I've identified, as well as the Bible speaks about them. Number one, Jesus Christ is the only way to being saved. When you go to university, they have these different courses, psychology, physiology, all of the ology them, that have different belief systems that tell you that this one will save you if you're bowed down, this one will save you if you're this. You have a lot of them. And in a sense, I understand why the universities incorporate them because them can't be one-sided, you know? Right, they will be sued. But... One of the things we must recognize as believers is that our salvation is built in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus is the cornerstone of our salvation. We must believe that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. In Acts 4.12, the scripture reads, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to man which, must, which we must be saved. So no auntie, no friend, no boss, no granny, no anybody like that can save us. Truth number two. Repentance is a necessary part of the process. Repentance is necessary for salvation. True repentance, when you come down here, you stand up and you say that prayer or wherever it is, whether you're in your living room, whatever, and you repeat the repentance prayer, that is just the first step. And it is a necessary step to becoming a believer in Christ. True repentance involves a changing of our mind and changing of our attitude towards sin. Acts 3.19 says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God. Not just repent, but and turn to God. 
so that your sins may be wiped away. We must recognize that when we get to a place of true repentance, it's not only about repenting of the things of the past, you know. God made it bad. No. True repentance, even for the believer, means that when we have entertained or encounter sin, we sorry about it. And not just saying, oh my God, you know, I answer somebody bad, I'm sorry. No. It brings us to a place where we say, I did wrong. Lord, if I offer offended you lord if me do not we separate me from you lord if me entertain not we separate me from you lord please forgive me and that is a part of the working out of our salvation to have a truly repentant heart repentance and salvation are are fundamentally meant to change us at our core that is what does the work at our core. So that the things like the fruits of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit can be manifested in us and through us. Though when we are at a place of truth, true repentance and salvation and surrender, because you have to surrender to repent. When we are at that place, we are signifying to God that we are open and that we are ready for him to do what it is that he has designed to do in our lives. And one thing I can say for sure, two things for certain, whatever it is that God has intended for our lives, it is always far better than what we have done. It's far better than what we intend. It's far better than what we can think, dream, or imagine. So people of God, don't be afraid to repent. If you do something bad to somebody, go to them and tell them, say, boy, you know, I was wrong. I was wrong to you. I was wrong to God. I have asked God to forgive me. You ask the person to forgive you too. Move on. Grow in it. And guess what? The more you do it, it's the more it comes easier to do it. The more you do it, the Lord can trust you with being in different positions and with different things. So repentance is not just for the unbeliever. It is also for the believer. Point number three, salvation gives us access. Now, when I was sharing this point with a friend of mine yesterday as I was going through, the person said to me, you mean like a passport? And I said, yeah, 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 like a passport, you know? And the truth be told is, salvation really is our passport to heaven. Not that one minute salvation, that moment of salvation, I should say, when you comb your ball and all of those things. But the fact that we are being saved is our passport to heaven. The truth of the matter is not just to heaven, but to eternal life. The truth of the matter is we all have eternity to face, you know. Everybody has eternity to face. Everybody has to determine where the eternal life will be. It's either going to be in heaven or it will either be in hell. So we must understand that really and truly our salvation is necessary. It is a necessary access pass to get us to eternal life in Jesus Christ. It is necessary. That far outweigh the good, any good that you think you could do. That far out wait. So if you have said that prayer, beautiful. You, have, you are on your way. And if you have said the prayer and has not followed through, let us get it together. Because access has been provided to us to eternal life. Now, we have spoken about Jesus Christ. We have spoken about repentance. We have spoken about the believer's access pass. And... Another attribute of salvation that the word mentions is that it is a gift. But I'm going to deal with the gift from two angles. One, one of the truths of salvation is that we must unwrap the gift daily. Yeah, man. Just like when somebody gives you a present and you take out all of the paper and so, because you want to actually get to the present, same thing. You have to unwrap it. You have to unpack it, right? How do we do that? Let us turn to Philippians 2, verse 12, amplified version for this one. So then, my dear ones, just as you have always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, 
let's go again. Just as you have always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. What that means? It means to cultivate it, to bring it to full effect, and to actively pursue spiritual maturity. With all inspiring fear and trembling, let us go back to the workout salvation. And this is for the believer that is being saved, us. When we talk about working out our salvation, we are interested in our spiritual growth. We are interested more in the spiritual growth than us being uncomfortable. We are interested more in the will of God for our lives more than our comfort or, or even sometimes our dreams and our desires. We are interested in the Lord plowing the places of our heart so that it can get to a place of maturity and purity so that it can trust our heart to do the right thing in different situations, to share his good news in the situation, all of that. And if we, if we view some of the things that we face from that perspective, we wouldn't be disheartened and dismayed in the plowing. We wouldn't be disheartened and dismayed in the cultivating. And one of the ways that, 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 that we can view that and hold on to it is knowing the God who we serve. Knowing the God that will never leave us nor forsake us. Knowing the God that, that has more for us than those that are against us. When we focus on the character of Jesus Christ, it allows us to go through the cultivating easier. It allows us to hold on to the name of Jesus. It allows us to know that we know that we know. It allows us to stand firm in faith, even in the face of adversity. That is what the cultivating does. Now let us talk about the fear and trembling, because it's like you asked me to cultivate and then you asked me to be afraid. The fear that is mentioned here is not the fear like a scaredy cared um, afraid. Like when somebody come around the corner and say, boy, you're frightened, is not that sort of fear. The fear that is mentioned here is in relation to respect. It is in relation to having a serious and a cautious attitude and posture towards your salvation. It is, it is, it is connected to a self-evaluating um, mindset. You don't want to offend God. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. That is the fear and trembling. When you take it from that point of view, you know, sometimes you say, boy, God, I just really don't want, Lord, if this is not you, I don't want to do it. That is the sort of fear. That is the sort of trembling. But it's not even just saying it from our lips. It's in our heart. We know, say, God, now go, please, I'm not going to do it. Right? And one of the ways that we, 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 we hold on to that too is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the process of sanctification is easier to take fruit and manifest in us. It's easier for, for us to be accepting to the things of God and what God wants to do by, by, by surrendering to the sanctification in Jesus Christ. So we must Fix our eyes on Jesus. What Jesus requires of us must become more important than anything else. Now, I mentioned earlier, and this is my final point. I mentioned earlier that salvation is a gift. In Ephesians, it mentioned that as well from one of our scriptures earlier. But I want to submit to you that salvation is not just a free gift, but it is also a gift offered to everyone from a position of love. Love is the basis on which salvation has been offered. Love is the grand motive for the plan of salvation for our lives. If we're not loving, people won't be saved. 
And we have to, we, the, the Lord requires us to be at a place where we love people so much that we are willing to, 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 to speak the truth of the gospel to them. We are willing to see them on the street and ask, have you been saved? We are willing to go beyond helping them by giving them a money or helping with an immediate need and be and love them so much that the posture of their heart towards God is important to us. We must look at the people around us, people of God, and offer the gift of salvation to them. It has freely been offered to you. Now freely give that, God, that gift to other persons. You know better worry how them will receive it. You know better determine whether them will receive it or not. You have the authority, you have the permission from God to give that gift to other persons. And as people of God, we should always want to give the gift. Get that youthful exuberance that my brother and I had, where we come back and say, oh, guess what? We're a Christian, we're saved. We must have that in order to build the kingdom of God and tell people about Jesus. No one buy a gift and keep it to themselves. No one buy a gift for somebody else and keep it to themselves. Like I said, Lady Yvette, I have a gift for you. But I'm not going to come here and keep it to myself. Who does that? Nobody does that from a pure place of buying a gift. As well as I can't say to Lady Rachel, Lady Rachel, you know, say, this is your gift. And Lady Rachel said, really, man? And she stopped and she looked at the gift and she turned the gift around. And what, but she never unwrap it and use it. That is what some of us are doing with our salvation. And that is what some, some of us are keeping others from. That is what we are cultivating for some persons. Give away the gift, man. It's free. The Lord will add him love to it. Give away the gift. And for those who haven't received the gift this morning, accept the gift. Accept the gift. Accept the gift of salvation. It is freely being given to you. And the motive behind it is love. John 3, 16, which most persons know, for God so loved. He gave his only son, your one dege dege picnic, as some of us would say, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have an eternal life. It is not the Lord's will for anybody to perish. And that is why salvation is for everyone. That is why we must speak the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to everyone. Sometimes you buck up on some persons and you say, Oh, are you saved? And them say, No, I'm no, 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 no God, man. I'm good, I'm no, no God. But I want to submit an analogy to you that I found in my research. Imagine all of us here, all of us online. Imagine we are in an airplane and we are going to go skydiving. All of a sudden, we get a little bravery in our heart and we say, yeah, man, all of we are going to skydive. And imagine one or two persons amongst us come to the door, because you have to go to the door of the airplane and jump, all right? I don't know if I'll do it. Let's see. But you go to the door and you say, all right, John, your turn. John, have the backpack, you know. Him have the parachute on him back. But John goes to the door and John starts to do this. He starts to form his own mechanism of saving. Him start using him hand, because him think making him hand go up and down like this. While him have the backpack with the parachute to save him in there. And he refuses to pull the cord. That is what people are like when they hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And they deny the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't be like John with the backpack. Pull the gift that was freely given to you. Don't be like John that ignores the truth of the saving grace of God because you want to lean on your own understanding. Let us submit ourselves to God. 
The Lord is calling some of us this morning. He's calling all of us. He's calling one, the believer to continue working out your salvation. Believers, what new have you seen manifested through us in recent time? Because the Lord always doing something new, you know. Have we gotten comfortable with where we are? Have we gotten comfortable with our different spaces with sharing the gospel and inviting persons to Jesus? Have we predetermined that people won't receive the gift that we have to give them? Have we? We may, we may not. If you are one that is, key, that is doing that too, continue doing it. Great job. The kingdom of heaven is cheering you on. For those that may not be doing it, come on, make we join them, man. Because the kingdom of God must be built here on earth. And the Lord is using us as his vessels in doing that. If you are here and you have not accepted the gift of God, you have not accepted the gift of salvation, my apologies. And you may be saying, just like my brother and I said, how does someone receive this gift? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 